slide two. Lovely. <laughs> I think it's going okay. Now. Lovely. So whilst it is undeniable that Cornwall has experienced some of the highest levels of in-migration across Britain since the 1960s, this talk today will seek to demonstrate how the picturesque phenomenon besieged the identities of Celtic maritime communities from as early as its emergence in the 18th century. As Philip Payton discusses in Cornwall since the war, it is widely considered that mass tourism took hold most intensely across the maritime communities situated across the Celtic peripheries in the 1960s. Neatly packaged holidays by the sea had become an expected and integral social ritual for the everyday working class person and considered by renowned author Daphne du Maurier to have reached an agonising peak by the time she had published her critical work Vanishing Cornwall in 1967. De Maurier created the first shift of Cornish landscape criticism, considering 1960s Cornish identity as purely commercial and sensationalistic. De Maurier's eloquent eulogy mourns a past where Cornwall operated from secluded inlets and quaint fishing villages and chimed the deteriorated ruinous state she describes as having had succumbed to beneath the hegemony of mass tourism. Yet which time period does Du Maurier's image of a perfect Cornwall return to? We must here remind ourselves that despite Du Maurier being an early member of Mebion Cano, she was born and raised in Hampstead in London. When she nostalgically reminisced of Cornwall's vanished past, de Maurier was evoking her own personal and idyllic version of the Cornish landscape and its heritage. This talk today will demonstrate how de Maurier's perception is problematic and shaped by the picturesque phenomena that dominated how British landscapes were interpreted from the mid 18th century. What is also significant about de Maurier's work is the belief that she reiterates a common feeling from this decade in which commodification of the Cornish landscape and its heritage was simply a sad and unwanted capitalist device. Both these nuances are what I aim to question today and especially the assumption that members of the local community have always resisted the idealised makeovers of their seaside villages and towns. As we shall see with this case study of, of Tintagel, a small slate mining and maritime community turned seaside retreat by the late 19th century. Many facilitators of this transition were indeed business owners or mining related investors. However, a small quantity of local individuals also encouraged tourists to visit the town with the request they paid attention to the local community. This emerges explicitly from as early as the 1870s, and from 1897, we can see by looking at the Cornwall and Devonshire Trades Directory, it, it excels with so much further until Tintagel's local stores not only double in number, but are renamed to associate King Arthur in some form. Evidence thus suggests the local inhabitants of Tintagel had not always well received the Arthurian narratives that pervaded the castle ruins sitting on their coastline, but have welcomed travellers and the fashion for seaside tourism. By 1898, Delabol Slate Quarry had cut back on employing local labour, alerting the community to a monopoly of inevitable changes that were required to make Tintagel a fully fledged holiday venue. Oh, apologies. Tintagel's local vicar of St. Materiana's from 1950 to 1976, A.C. Canner, looks back to how Trevena presented a very different appearance from what it does today in the early 1890s. Kalla describes a multitude of building conversions taking place post-1890, including the Methodist chapel into a bakery, then a shop, which sat next to a, quote, string of picturesque old cottages, of which some still interestingly survive today. 
Trevena House, he goes on to say, was converted from the holiday home of Sir Arthur and Lady Hayter into a partition for King Arthur's halls 30 years later. A series of hotels were also created from high street buildings, as were all types of shops and boarding houses. But what specifically do we attribute Tintagel's facial renovation to, and most importantly, to whom? To answer, I will examine the emergence of travel literature and merchandise inspired by Tintagel, drawing on the impact of periodicals, newspaper articles, poetry, travel guides and postcards. In turn, I devote this close analysis of travel literature to the wider context of the picturesque movement and then how it was politically and economically rendered to shape tourism in Britain during the Napoleonic Wars a hundred years earlier. The picturesque from Tivoli to Tintagel, that is the name of this chapter in, um, in the article that I wrote for the recent publication. The picturesque aesthetic was propelled to the height of fashion throughout the 18th century as grand tourists returned from their Italian adventures with the 17th century landscape paintings of Claude Lorraine, Nicolas Poussin or Salvatore Rosa. Their landscapes revealed edited out imperfections of the natural world, instead replaced with idyllic scenes, perfectly applying tonality, composition and balance to demonstrate an unwittingly tamed wilderness. These scenes included most often ruinous historic structures that would evoke a return to antiquity as a means of demonstrating the ancient character of the landscape. For the British aristoc aristocracy, the opportunity to display explicit evidence of their worldly travels in their grand picture galleries at home was made even more attractive when they could simultaneously emphasise their own family's traditional and historic line. Quite naturally, these artworks confined to picture galleries made their way outside and into the extensive gardens of the wealthy. This period often witnesses the intermingling of the outside wilderness and the interior and is discussed most interestingly by the recent research of Rebecca Trapp at the University of Cambridge. The notion of recreating Italianate landscapes, both in landscape architecture, developed from the experimentations of British artists, those at home and those studying abroad. Individuals began to portray places across Britain that would suitably fit into the picturesque mould, promulgating their enthusiasm for natural scenery in poetry, paintings and novels that would soon feed the designs of notable landscape ar architects. As James Thompson's poem The Seasons rose to nationwide success, Welsh painter Richard Wilson's widely published mezzotint view of Messina's villa in Tivoli was the catalyst to the waterfalls, ruins and temple pavilions populating the country gardens of the wealthy. Sir William Chambers, William Kent and Lancelot Capability Brown are three key landscape architects who facilitated these designs. And it is important to maintain that at the centre of the picturesque movement was indeed the enthusiasm for the natural world, articulated most clearly by the romantic ideologies stemming from Enlightenment thinkers, effectively. For those who could not afford the luxury of visiting these perfectly composed estates, there was the option to visit the wildernesses of Britain instead. So from the late 1760s, the essays and guides of Reverend William Gilpin served as a great advocator of many British picturesque landscapes that had until now been deemed disagreeably ugly. From the Lake District, the Welsh mountains, to the Cornish coastline, they all possess certain characteristics to be admired and likened to the picturesque ideals debated about by Enlightenment theorists. <laughs> Travel literature and associated merchandise swept the nation, urging a domestic grand tour, 
from guides to purchasing your very own Claude glass, the act of traveling to Cornwall became a seriously intellectual and patriotic business. And for those who are unfamiliar with the term Claude glass, you can see me fashioning one here in the Lake District. And it is a small mirror that was popularized by poet Thomas Gray's journal of his tour in the Lake District, published in 1775. And these were devices that were often used by artists and travellers, and they would have the effect of reducing the tonal range of the landscape and scenery to give them a painterly quality, almost like a pre-photographic lens. Since the 1707 Act of Union brought Scotland to England, Wales and Cornwall, the idea of Great Britain was indeed becoming popularised in the national consciousness. What's more, this new vogue for domestic tourism no longer confined the activity to simply the elite, encouraging the working classes and middling sorts to also spend domestically, providing an income for the more secluded rural communities. The patriotic sentiment surrounding domestic tourism grew to its zenith by the end of the 18th century, where war with France had prevented members of the aristocracy in fulfilling their grand tours of Europe. Certain landmarks of Britain were hence promoted as equally, if not more enticing, as those abroad. Although Herculaneum, Pompeii, Florence and Rome could offer insights into Greco-Roman civilization, the northern lakes of Britain to the dramatic coastline of Cornwall could offer exciting histories of the ancient Britons. Tintagel became part of this broader arena of travel performance that urged British travellers to explore their heroic indigenous past. Their earliest form of picturesque travel literature originated with the complete English traveller, or a new survey of England and Wales containing a full account of whatever is curious and entertaining in 1771. An abundance of informative scripted travel literature followed with Dugdale's weekly, period, blah, 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 with Dugdale's weekly periodicals, The New British Traveller in the 1780s. By 1799, Thomas Gray's travelling companion directed visitors to Tintagel's nearby Nathan's Cave near Bosney to experience the, quote, inspiration of visceral natural beauty. And by the turn of the century, Tintagel was not only a legendary landmark, but it offered artists and writers alike a quaint community and an idyllic setting to further exploit. And then we have St. Nathan's uh, Cave near Botany. Oh no, sorry, this is St. Nathan's Glen. But um, it, was, it was very much um, bringing together all of these different components and, and these similar landscapes. And then we also have St. Matriana's Church next. Yes, there we are. St. Matriana's Church was also described as possessing an ancient dovecot in the Vicarage Garden in picturesque excursions and later on described as having to actually sell its bells to a London buyer who considered them the same as those that had quote told for King Arthur and there we are with its magical bells. Turner also published a highly fanciful engraving of the castle in, in 1819 and six years later is referenced in Thomas Hogg's book, the or publication, The Famous History of the Ancient Kingdom of Cornwall. So the ruins of the Dark Age castle were no longer acquainted with Earl Richard, but instead the magical King Arthur. And this suitably fit the Claude Lorraine style landscapes, so beautifully populating the route for the British Grand Hall. Indeed, it was during Lord Alfred Tennyson's own grand tour visitation almost 20 years later that led to his famous works, Mort d'Arthur and then Idylls of the King in 1859. Tennyson was tapping into the images conjured by Geoffrey of Monmouth's Historia Regium Britanni, written circa 1135 to 38. And all of a sudden Tintagel was advertised as an ancient attraction in Cornish, Scottish, Welsh and London newspapers. 
Tintagel also fit the sublime characteristics endorsed by Gilpin and Edmund Burke. From the violent waves crashing against Merlin's cave beneath the castle's ruins to the black smog rising from Delabole's slate mine, the scene resembles Gilpin's description in his observations on the River Wye and several parts of, the South, of South Wales, uh, published in 1782. And here we see a beautiful quote, which I think very much embodies um, this whole characteristic in this, in this landscape. Where the first half of the 19th century saw huge wealth derived from copper and tin mining, the second half reaped with the benefits in a building boom that catapulted Cornwall to the height of Gothic picturesque fashion, according to Nicholas Pevsner. Blah, blah, blah. Well, it's very difficult to say his name. So here we have the beautiful Camelot Castle, or considered beautiful by some. From Horace Walpole's Gothic Strawberry Hill House in the 1750s, the Gothic style had risen to popularity nationally from the late 1800s, aided by the promotions of A.W.N. Pugin, declaring it as especially British and Christian. This is introduced into the Cornish architectural vocabulary on a grand scale by John Loughborough Pearson, who in 1880 built Truro Cathedral, famous for its Gothic vaulting. George Edward Street, William White, Sylvanus Travail and the Setting family followed Pearson's crowning glory and became the key Cornish protagonists of the Gothic, of the Gothic revival style. They henceforth contributed to the explosion of 900 Methodist chapels built in 1900 and the replacement of pre-1850 style chapels, all under the picturesque Gothic model. The Anglican church responded with an energetic vigour, replacing its churches with modern arts and crafts Gothic features. For example, at Laddock, a beautiful display of Morris and Co glass showcases Street's innovative collaboration with William Morris and the emergence of arts and crafts Gothic being applied to Cornwall's Anglican architecture. The Sedding Brothers similarly endorse this particular strand of revival Gothic, applying it to 63 new and restored churches. The Gothic aesthetic was evidently developing its own myriad of strands. These architects were all instrumental in the reinvention of Cornwall as a modern picturesque holiday retreat, as both John Mutton and Peter N. Linfield suggest the breadth of the 19th century saw medieval inspired Gothic revival interiors being applied to new houses or newly refur refurbished rooms as a means of modernising a space. And so we see a similar treatment with Sylvanus Travail's King Arthur's Camelot Hotel, built between 1898 and 1899 in the medieval Gothic revival style. As the hotel's symmetrical castellated towers rise into the skyline from the clifftop, adjacent to castle ruins and overlooking Merlin's cave, it seems that Travail was harking back to illustrations and ideas of Sir Richard Payne Knight and Sir Uvedale Price almost a hundred years earlier. And so both of these gentlemen architects come collectors appealed for a, a new type of painter architect who would approach the composition of a building much like a landscape painter. Travail's hotel appears to recreate the same amount of drama described by Price and dominates the horizon by manipulating the fall of natural light upon its castellated exterior. We can assume that Travail is drawing on well-known visual Gothic tropes to endorse his hotel as in the modern taste, but it's also as an exciting theatrical experience. The hotel was funded by Sir Robert Harvey, who had risen to wealth via Salt Petra production in Bolivia, Peru and Chile. And by 1883, Harvey had returned to Truro, his town of birth, and became a prominent landowner in Cornwall and Devon, funding various finan financial schemes that encouraged travel to the southwest. Evidently, Harvey saw a financial opportunity when it came to building a neo-gothic castle hotel upon the adjacent cliffs to the site most recently declared as King Arthur's birthplace by famous Lord Alfred Tennyson in his republished poem 
idyls of the king four years prior. Increasingly, more travellers flocked to the famous site, described by Tennyson, whose republished poem had responded to such a national demand to consume mythical British history that it sold 10,000 copies simply within its first week. Visitors now desired to climb the ruinous castle and peer down upon where the legendary figure was supposedly discovered by Merlin with Tennyson's book in hand. And of course, just another glimpse of the poem there. So why not immerse themselves in the full experience and spend a night at King Arthur's Camelot Hotel? The theatrical experience didn't stop there. Seawater cures were also advertised by the Royal Cornwall Gazette and many more local newspapers in December 1898, offering the hotel's customers hot and cold sea water baths from Merlin's cave with electric motors on Tintagel's beach. There we are. Exciting gimmicks such as these were all the result of concerned business owners who required a boom in business. We know that they were key agents behind the Cornish magazine, a periodical that was published between 1898 and 1899, which discussed how to respond to the rapid decline in the Cornish economy. Joni Willis also suggests this periodical reflected the divide between the wants of society leaders and their workers, evident through descriptions of how they perceived the landscape as clean, untainted by several centuries of intense mining activity that could be repurposed for the invalid or the psychic visitor. Um, they indeed wanted to tap into an ongoing fascination with the healing properties of seawater, which had grabbed the British aristocracy since Dr. Richard Russell's declarations in, Georgian, in the Georgian period from 1750. Brilliant case studies such as Brighton had offered a success story, attracting hordes of the wealthy elite to bathe in the cold seawater and at the same time inject the maritime town with a new burst of cash. However, when this was attempted in Tintagel, say, some anti-tourist sentiment had already developed amongst the local townspeople and even the tourists themselves. Merchandise. <clears throat> so by the 1870s, the selling of Tintagel merchandise suggests a positive growth in visitors. Francis Frith started selling postcards with photographs of the derelict ruins grazed upon by sheep, the perfect desolate place for a summer adventure. However, in response to this, a local Trevena woman named Catherine Johns started to sell her own illustrated postcards, yet showing the old post office as the heart of the community and a symbol which should be saved from neglect. Johns raised the funds to repair the old building, circulating a competing image to Frith's postcards. Instead of ruins, Johns presented local children playing in front of the old post office, amongst many other scenes capturing everyday community life. Needless to say, Johns was playing Frith at his own game and presenting an alternate picturesque scene that would have been much approved by Humphrey Repton, the rustic country cottage. Where the Johns was attending to encourage tourism and attract more people into the village itself is not clear. Perhaps she was simply taking advantage of the passing trade in order to save a prestigious building. Either way, John shows how it was not strictly the business owners of the town who were fueling a new age of travelling merchandise. So overall, Tintagel, a microcosm to the bigger picture. So today I've tried to demonstrate how Tintagel could serve as an accurate example of what was happening in the wider context of Cornwall during the rise of domestic tourism and its intrinsic link to the picturesque, picturesque aesthetic. Business owners and tourist agencies in the 1960s were not only jump-starting a 19th century strategy to transform Cornwall into a holiday venue, but continue its popularity as a picturesque tourist destination. Indeed, the unique character of Tintagel has been evidently exploited repeatedly and by not only grand tourists, but the local community too. Thank you very much. 
Um, and if you would like to learn more about uh, any of the topics that I have brought up today, then um, I do actually discuss this in our three part documentary, which um, we can always mention a bit later to or post any links to, but you can find all of the videos um, and related literature on the website, which I think I have a link here. I don't, but it's Cornish Maritime Churches. Um, so if you look it up online and then these are our social handles, so there should be lots of information on there too.